How's it going, guys? We have a past little question for surgery for 2CK. If you're studying for step one, I mean, medium difficulty, I'll give it to you, all right? I mean, it can be difficult initially to differentiate these uh, high-yield conditions, all right? I'll tell you exactly what you need to know. This could be a lengthy discussion, but not going to waste our time. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. I really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Links down below. Find me on Telegram. Links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. And I'll start the clip. So 46-year-old man comes in for a routine health maintenance exam. He's been smoking two packs of cigarettes and drinking four ounces of vodka daily for 20 years. He has a one-month history of bloating and foul-smelling stools. He was hospitalized on two prior occasions for, for abdominal pain. Vitals are within normal limits. Serum amylase, lipase, bilirubin, and ALP are all normal. Serum calcium is 9.0 milligrams per deciliter. Normal range 8.4 to 10.2. Question wants to know most likely diagnosis. So let's just whip through the answer choices here. Choice A, cholecystitis. Wrong fucking answer. This guy, uh, we don't have any acute abdominal pain here. And he doesn't have a fever. <clears throat> So the way you answer cholecystitis on U.S. simile is it's going to sound like cholelithiasis. It's going to sound like a stone in the gallbladder, okay? It can be fat, 40s female, fertile, doesn't matter. But you're going to get uh, epigastric or right upper quadrant pain. They can say worse after fatty meals, very buzzy stuff, all right? But then you just add a fever on top of it, and we now call it cholecystitis, okay? But we don't have a fever here. His vitals are within normal limits. They'll always give you a fever in that case. Wrong fucking answer. Choice B, real quick, for, for those of you studying for 2CK, you should know that ultra, actually for cholestitis, ultrasound is our first step in diagnosis. If your ultrasound is negative, you're going to do a HIDAS scan, okay? That's what they want you to know. That'll be confirmatory for cholecystitis in patients who have an equivocal or negative ultrasound. Choice B, cholodoclothiasis, wrong answer. This refers to a stone in the biliary tree, not in the gallbladder itself, which is cholodoclothiasis. So cholodoclothiasis will present with increased ALP and bilirubin, okay? It can obviously direct bilirubin for obstruction. They can just say total bilirubin's increased and you have to infer, all right? But they'll always say ALP and bilirubin are increased in cholodoclothiasis. So they can also tell you that a patient had a cholecystectomy a week ago and that intraoperative cholangiography was not performed, okay? The implication being they didn't visualize the biliary tree when they were removing the gallbladder. Perhaps there was a retained stone in the cystic duct, and that's the part of the bile duct that uh, comes directly off the gallbladder, and then that stone descended into the common bile duct in the week following the cholestectomy. That'll be a high yield presentation of cholodoclithiasis. You also need to know that if the stone in the biliary tree descends uh, inferiorly enough where it cuts off the hepatopancreatic ampulla, you can get what's called gallstone pancreatitis, where you get increased amylase and lipase. Okay, you have pancreatitis due to cholodoclithiasis. You're going to do ultrasound first. They'll often say it in the question that's negative, which it will be in cholodoclithiasis pretty much always. And then your next best step is going to be ERCP, which is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Wrong fucking answer. Choice C, cholothiasis, wrong answer. I mean, I just talked about this. Fat 40s, female fertile, no fever in this case, all right? Choice D, pancreatitis is our correct answer. Now, instantaneously, some of you are like, wait, what the fuck? I don't get it. Amylase and light pace are normal. You're right, I'm an asshole, okay? This isn't acute pancreatitis. This is chronic pancreatitis, which is completely different. So chronic pancreatitis is going to present as steatorrhea, in usually an alcoholic, okay? It's someone who's had uh, recurrent bouts of acute pancreatitis. Now, he was hospitalized on two prior occasions for abdominal pain, implication being he's had a history of acute pancreatitis. He's obviously a heavy drinker, okay? So, steatorrhea, your pancreatic, your pancreas is burned out, okay? So, your amylase and lipase are not going to be elevated. They can be low, they can be normal, it doesn't matter, but they're not going to be elevated. And you have Deficiency of pancreatic enzymes, proteases, lipases. Okay, you get fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption. You get steatorrhea. You're going to treat this with pancrelipase, which is just enzyme supplementation. I've seen the term pancrelipase as an answer on one of the clinical mastery series forms for 2CK. All right, so this is chronic pancreatitis, high-yield diagnosis, okay, steatorrhea in a patient who's an alcoholic, 
or who has history of acute pancreatitis episodes. Very important. In contrast to acute pancreatitis where, yes, your amylase and lipase will be elevated, all right? Now you say, well, what about the calcium here? Well, this is normal. It's very important, you know, for US family, particularly 2CK, that they love low calcium as a poor prognostic indicator for acute pancreatitis. Okay, it's part of the Ransom criteria. You don't have to get hysterical over memorizing it. You should just know that low calcium and high glucose are US family favorites for poor prognostic indicators in acute pancreatitis, all right? Choice, and you're gonna do uh, as the next best step of management, a triad, which is gonna be NG tube, nothing by mouth, which is NPO, and fluids, okay? They don't ask about imaging for pancreatitis as to my observation, but pa patients can sometimes get a CT scan to look for fluid collections if they don't resolve. But the, but the triad is high yield for 2CK surgery of NPO, which is nothing by mouth, nasogastric tube, and IV fluids. They'll usually ask one of those three when you get a vignette of acute pancreatitis. Choice E, pseudocyst, strong fucking answer. This is just gonna be a collection of fluid within the pancreas. I've seen one question on this only for 2CK, right? You think it's a high yield diagnosis. I mean, in theory, it would be a patient who has acute pancreatitis where it's not resolving. And then you do a CT scan, you see what looks like an abscess, but it's not. It's just a fluid collection. It's called a pseudocyst because there's no truly defined walls. It's just the parenchyma holding the fluid collection together. But I've seen a question on the surgery form where they show you a CT scan of a giant circular lesion within the pancreas. It's ginormous, okay? It's not difficult to identify in this particular CT scan. And uh, they just wanted pseudocyst as the answer for that, okay? And they wanted, well, they wanted you to know pseudocyst and then they wanted ERCP, which is a weird answer, but you drain pseudocyst internally via either ERCP or you can actually do an endoscopic ultrasound, but I haven't seen the latter assessed on USMLE. They just want ERCP for internal drainage. So your point of consolidation here is, I want you to know chronic pancreatitis, holy shit, not just acute pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis can be normal or low pancreatic enzymes. You're going to have steatorrhea in an alcoholic, someone who's had a current episodes of acute pancreatitis. You're going to treat with pancreatic enzyme supplementation, can show up as pancrelipase on USMLE. You know the deal, makes you make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. And I appreciate your time. That's it.